And so if you're calling for sort of policies that are agreed for by a majority of Americans or maybe, you know, closer to the center, what kind of reforms do you see, uh, you know, practically that could, you know, reduce uh, the social unrest in the United States? What kind of things can we, are we talking about? Well, you might be surprised, but a majority of Americans do support immigration reform that will expand legal immigration. Americans like immigration, generally, as long as it's legal. Uh, so if we have an orderly process that can process larger numbers of people, the economy will do better, America will grow, and I, I'm sure we can get broad agreement on that. I think immigration reform has been really blocked by extreme minorities, and the Trump administration pushed really hard in the direction of reducing all kinds of legal migration. So I think we'll have an immigration reform that will be solid. I think we'll finally get infrastructure because most Americans agree that our infrastructure has fallen behind leading world standards. It's terrible to have people come to America and say, your subways are old and broken down. Your roads and bridges are in awful conditions. Your airports are third world quality. Americans don't like to hear that. There'll be a huge majority in, in support of improving that because it brings jobs. It's a good way to spend money. We'll certainly have broad support for uh, improving the rollout of vaccines and giving financial support to people affected by COVID. I think we'll also have broad support for uh, removing some of the anonymous shells, as we've already seen, and for uh, strengthening uh, enforcement of existing tax law, making evasion more difficult, cracking down on people who have been fraudulent and scoffing at the law. One of the, again, little things not known. Uh, under Trump, the IRS was told, don't bother, don't go after rich people. It's too complicated. They can have too many lawyers. They bog things down in court. Didn't used to be that way. The IRS used to go after everybody, especially the rich people, because that's where they could get more money back for the U.S. government. So we need to restore that kind of vigor in our finances. Um, so I think those are the easy things, what we call the low-hanging fruit. What will be somewhat more difficult is improving health care. But again, I think we'll find a majority because Americans do recognize that most rich people around the world have good health care as a right of citizenship, and Americans don't. I think we'll be able to build a coalition around fixing that. I don't know what the details will be that will emerge, mm -hmm. but I think if you can get it, you know, we did Social Security, we did Medicare, we can do a national health plan of some sort. It'll combine private and public, it'll combine insurance and other elements. But it's going to be better than what we have now, where Americans live in fear of not having proper health care. How realistic is that, given that, for instance, you know, of course, the health insurance companies are donating to both parties, both Democrats and Republicans. And if you look at someone maybe who wanted to do an overhaul of the health care system, I think Bernie Sanders wanted a universal health care system, but that was blocked. So how realistic really is it that those kind of more maybe radical, more, uh, more income distributing policies that you talk about to reduce inequality, that they will actually be implemented? Well, here's the good news. Because Democrats have a narrow majority, they cannot be completely stymied. They can tell the Republicans, if you don't work with us, you're going to end up on the losing side of some extreme measures that get 100% Democrat support. Or you can work with us on a measure that might only have 70% Democrat support that would lose the Elizabeth Warrens and the uh, extreme progressives. But you know, if you give us half of your Republican votes, and we have two thirds of our Democrat votes, we can pass something that will keep the extremists at bay. But if you don't, you know, if you're going to go in your shell and not cooperate, we're going to have to work with our extreme wing to pass something that Democrats can do on their own. So I think Biden can say, look, don't put me in a box. Don't push me to where I have to satisfy my progressives first, work with me together, and let's rebuild the center. That's Biden's inclination. That's his history. Those are his contacts in the Senate and in the House. So I'm very optimistic that that can be done. So we're approaching the end of the interview. So let's look a bit into the future. Um, firstly, short term, how do you see things unfolding in the next 14 days? Well, in the next 14 days, I believe the effort of the White House staff will be to try and restrain President Trump. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I imagine that Trump will call for another rally or support. 
Uh, I think law enforcement, if there is such a rally, will now be on notice to be better prepared. So I, I expect Trump to still try and uh, spread his lies that he didn't lose and to appeal for support that's been financially good for him. So I think the main thing people have to realize is it's taken decades to build up this degree of social division. Nothing's going to change it, not this uh, revulsion at the riot in the Capitol, not Trump leaving office. These are superficial things. In order for us to avoid the risk of massive social unrest recurring periodically in the next few years, we have to start to turn around this ship and attack some of these underlying conditions. We need to address lack of social mobility and the heightened level of inequality. We need to address people's economic fears about what will happen in the future. Will their communities, you know, they have, they have a path for their children even to move forward in life. A lot of people feel despair. Um, we need to overcome the polarization and dysfunction among our elites. That's why I'm saying I'm optimistic, but it's absolutely essential that a center is built. And that's why I think it's so great that Biden won this narrow majority. If the Senate remained Republican, and they chose to just stonewall and, and turn the Biden uh, administration into a failure to, at any cost, then the polarization would get worse. We'd be stuck in this. People would lose their faith in government, and we'd have a horrible mess going into the next election. Mm -hmm. If the next two years can demonstrate centrists can work together, that will help centrist politicians in both parties do better in 2022 and get us more in the right direction we need. The progressive movement took a couple of decades to get America on a better path. We need a new progressive movement. Uh, it, it's nice to say that uh, President Trump is the first American incumbent since Herbert Hoover to lose the presidency, the House, and the Senate. Mm -hmm. And what came after Hoover was difficult times at first and a real challenge, but a lot of good progressive legislation that won large majority support and that transformed America. That's literally where we got Social Security and, uh, in the first place, right? Yeah. So this may be another such positive time when America can pull its center together again. And if it does so, I think we can get out of this mess. And I hope 10 years from now, my model will say, uh, <laughs> look, America has backed off from this curve. We're in a much more stable domain and we can start to rebuild our economy and society as the liberal democracy that Americans love and want. So that's my hope for the future here. Now, let's hope around the rest of the world, there's a lot of injustice. There are revolutions to come. Don't count it out. The Arab Spring was not the last gasp, so beware. No. Okay, well, let's hope the model stays positive, but stays at least. <laughs>